Today's subject is Adalatu Sahaba, which is uprightness of the companions, alayhim ridwan. Now, in order to understand this subject, we need to break down definitions of the compound of Adalatu Sahaba, which is the uprightness of the companions. The word Adala would translate as uprightness and the word of Sahaba as the companions. So what is meant by each of these two words? Firstly, with regard to the word of Sahaba, the word of Sahaba is in reference to the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those people who were in the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how does Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah recognize the status of these companions and how do they, more importantly, how do they define these companions? How do you define an actual Sahabi? How do you get to the meaning of a Sahabi, meaning its technical meaning as opposed to its linguistical meaning? Because linguistically, the word Sahabi is just someone who accompanied another person. That person could be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. But here, the word Sahabi is in reference to the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this regard, the scholars of Islam, specifically the scholars of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, the Sunni scholars have said that the companion Sahabi meant here is the one who congregates with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sits in the blessed company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or sees with his own eyes the blessed person of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees him, but with a condition. That condition is that the person must have Iman faith. So when a person believes in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes faith in, in Allah and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran. After this, he believes and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees him or he sees the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this state then such a person is called a Sahabi. The question would be, what if a person saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a state of disbelief, but later, afterwards, after the departing of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he became a Muslim. Would such a person fall under the definition of Sahabi? The answer is no. A Sahabi, a companion, is the one who sees the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he has Iman at the time of seeing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees him. This is the first condition of defining any Sahabi. So when we say Adalatu Sahaba, the meaning of a Sahaba is those, those people who have Iman when they saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw them. Secondly, after having the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the person must have consistency and Iman and faith stay steadfast on faith and pass away on Iman also. So if a person after having seen the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Iman, with faith, or the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having seen him, passes away on disbelief, renegades from the religion, then such a person is not considered a Sahabi. He's, he is no longer considered a Sahabi. The virtue of Suhba, which is the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is dropped from him. So, the first condition was 
staying in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with faith, iman, having seen the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with iman, or the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeing him. And the second condition is being steadfast on iman and faith until the person passes away on faith, on iman. So, here when the iman, the faith of an individual is established, you can never take that person out of Islam until something which negates his Islam is also established. Meaning, if a person says, La ilaha illallah, Sayyiduna Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the testimony of faith, this brings them into Islam. Or you see a person standing and praying the five daily prayers. In order to declare that individual a disbeliever, the proof that is needed to declare that individual a disbeliever must be something that negates the iman, the faith with certainty. It cannot be something which has possibility of disbelief, but no certainty. So if the belief of a companion, Sahabi, is established through tawatur, mass transmission, then the disbelief must also be established through mass transmission. You cannot say, based on this doubt, this person may have left Islam. No. In order to declare that individual a non-believer, a disbeliever, then the type of proof that is needed is the type of proof that, de- that imparts certainty. Without certainty, you can never declare a common Muslim a disbeliever. This is why the scholars have said that if someone utters a statement which has 99 ways in which it could be interpreted as disbelief, but one possibility of being belief, then you give the preference to the belief over the disbelief. This is in relation to anathematizing or excommunicating another Muslim. That if there are 99 possibilities that the person is a disbeliever, but one strong possibility that the person is a believer, then you do not anathematize him or declare him a disbeliever with a common Muslim. So anyone who accompanies the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in order for anyone to declare that individual as a disbeliever, they would need certainty as opposed to possibilities. Meaning, a solitary narration would not be sufficient to declare any one of the companions a disbeliever. If the iman, the faith of that companion was established through mass proof, mass evidence, mass transmitted reports. Someone may question at this point by saying, what if this Sahabi becomes a Muslim accepts Islam but then decides to renegade from Islam. After renegading from Islam he accepts Islam again within the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Is such a person considered a Sahabi? This happened with certain people like Abdullah bin Abi Sarh. He left Islam and then after the conquering of Mecca al mukarramah he entered the fold of Islam again. At the same time, you had people who renegated from Islam like Abdullah bin Khattal and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had him executed during the conquering of Mecca al mukarramah But what would be the status of the person who accepted Islam in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then left Islam and then accepted Islam again would such a person be considered a Sahabi regarding this the position of Al-Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an with agreement firstly that we do not curse such an individual cursing such an individual is prohibited but the suhbah, the reward of the suhbah for such a person is dropped. The reward 
of suhbah, of accompanying the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is dropped, even though his Islam is accepted. This was the opinion of Al Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an, as mentioned by Al Imam Ibrahim Al Bajuri in his commentary on the Jawhara known as Tuhfatul Murid. The Maliki school have difference of opinion amongst themselves. Some of them take the position of Al Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an. Now, within the Maliki school, when they cannot agree upon a rajih opinion, meaning a preferable opinion, then they tend to go to other schools. In this case, some of them chose the Shafi'i position. Nevertheless, when we discuss Adalatul Sahaba, we are not discussing those who renegated in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are discussing those who stayed consistent upon Islam within the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and passed away on Islam. So this is the definition of a Sahaba. Whenever we discuss a Sahaba, the companions, it is those group, that group of people that accepted Islam in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stayed in the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam, and stayed consistent, steadfast on Islam and passed away on Islam. When we discuss Adala, which is the, when we look at the compound Adala to Sahaba, meaning a composition of two terms, Adala and as Sahaba. The, f- the first word, which is Adala, which would translate as uprightness. What does this term mean and what does this term entail? Some people who curse the companions Alihim or Ridwan understand this to mean that when Sunni Muslims state Adalatul Sahaba, they believe the companions Ali Muridwan to be sinless. But this is a mistake. When the Sunni Muslims say uprightness of the companions, they mean those people who were steadfast on Islam firstly did not lie regarding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Meaning, anyone who in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam accepted Islam, stayed steadfast on Islam, you can never find them forging a hadith, concocting a hadith in the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is one aspect of Adalatul Sahaba, that all those people who accepted Islam in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, none of them ever forged a hadith in the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or attributed a lie to him. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as is narrated by over 70 companions, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Which is, whoever lies upon me purposefully, then let him take his seat in hellfire. So the number of people who narrated this are those very same people who we call as sahaba meaning those people who accepted Islam in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his company and then they stayed steadfast on Islam and they passed away on Islam. Those same as sahaba companions narrate that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever lies upon me purposefully then let him take his seat in the hellfire. These same people fulfill the criteria of Adala, which is uprightness, that they do not lie regarding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, after taking this definition, if a person goes through the books of history, goes through the books of Hadith, and attempts to find faults with different Sahaba saying they committed this sin or this person committed this sin unless they can establish the disbelief of a companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the fisk meaning sin of a companion could never negate Adalatul Sahaba which is uprightness of the companions meaning in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a companion drank alcohol. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam applied 
the corporal punishment, hudud punishment upon him. He did the sin again. When he was punished, he did the sin again. After some time, after some months, he did the sin again. Some of the people said, O Messenger of Allah, curse him. La'an, curse him. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam refused to curse him, mentioning that he loves Allah and his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This shows that any companion that carries out a sin, it is impermissible to curse him, la'an. Cursing is impermissible. And for people to look for their sins through the books in order to highlight their sins is also impermissible. And this is what the scholars of Islam meant when they said it is impermissible to go through certain events. Why? Because most events were not established with certainty. So many uh, examples we shall cover that those examples do not impart certainty. Therefore it would be impermissible for a person to attempt to find faults. We have examples of this. Many years ago a particular scholar in Pakistan who's passed away now, he found a narration in the work al Jami of Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi, one of the six books of Hadith. Ascribing to Sayyiduna Ali, Karamallahu Wajhahu Al-Kareem, that Sayyiduna Ali, Karamallahu Wajhahu Al-Kareem, according to that narration, before the prohibition of alcohol, drank alcohol and became drunk, and led the prayer, and when he led the prayer, Wal-Iyadu Billah, he read the Qur'an incorrectly. And after these verses of the Qur'an were revealed prohibiting alcohol. When this narration is presented to the Sunni ulama, the Sunni scholars, they have consistency. Why, do Sunni, why does the Sunni methodology have consistency? And when I say Sunni, I mean uh, Sunni as opposed to Wahhabism. Why do the Sunnis have consistency? Because when this narration is presented, they critique the narration by saying this narration is khabrul ahad, meaning a solitary report. The narrator has made a mistake in identifying that companion as Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. Because Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an is free from reciting the Qur'an incorrectly and committing disbelief. Because the narration says whoever recited the Qur'an recited it incorrectly due to being intoxicated and recited it with disbelief. So the Sunni ulama said, no, the narrator has made a mistake in identifying Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an as doing such a thing. This is consistency in accordance with the Sunni methodology. Because when the Sunnis are presented with such narrations regarding esteemed companions of the Messenger of Allah, solitary reports, the Sunni methodology is very consistent. So if someone says, According to them, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an may have said this. The report is solitary and the reporter may have made a mistake. And Sunni scholars can identify the narrator who may have made the mistake when they compare that solitary, solitary report with other reports. Like the report of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. Other narrators narrate and identify another companion as opposed to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. But if someone had not adopted the Sunni methodology and adopts a Nasibi methodology, a Nasibi methodology, a person who hates the Ahlul Bayt, they would latch onto this report in Al Jami of Al Imam Al Tirmidhi. So imagine a man coming to a Sunni masjid to question the Sunni Imam. He says to the Sunni Imam, in your book, Al Jami of Al Imam Al Tirmidhi, it is found that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. And of course, a Nasibi would not even say Sayyiduna Ali. He would say that Ali did this and did this and did this. A Sunni scholar would have consistency in his methodology. He would say this is a solitary report. The narrator has made a mistake. And he would tell the person that you are mistaken in identifying that person as being Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. And this is a consistent methodology of Sunni scholarship. So, when we say Adalatu Sahaba, one of the main things is that the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam do not lie regarding the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
What is the greatest proof of this? In which year was the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance given to Sayyiduna Ali, karamallahu wajhahu al-kareem? The oath of allegiance was given in the year 35. After this we know that the battle of Jamal and the battle of Sifin occurred. Thousands of companions took the side of the people of Syria. Thousands of companions who had t- accepted Islam in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam were under the banner of Muawiyah radiallahu an. Yet not a single one of them forged a hadith in order to say that Muawiyah radiallahu an has this virtue, or this companion has this virtue, or this group has this virtue. In fact, they did not, many of them did not even narrate hadith. And those who did narrate hadith, they narrated very little hadith. So forging did not occur in the time of the companions Ali Muridwan. Likewise, in the battle of Al-Jamal, when Talha radiallahu an approached Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an reminded him of what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold. When Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an quoted the hadith, Sayyiduna Talha could have retorted easily that this hadith you narrate but I narrate another hadith. He could have forged a hadith. Instead Sayyiduna Talha turned around and left the battlefield remorseful. <coughs> Likewise, Sayyiduna Zubair radiallahu an in Al-Jamal, he turned away from the battlefield, remorseful. Those companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have easily forged a hadith, but n- to this day no historian, even those historians who are critical of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like the <coughs> Orientalists are unable to show forgery of hadith at the hands of the companions Ali Muridwan. So this is one of the meanings of Adalatu Sahaba. What does Adalatu Sahaba also entail in Sunni scholarship? What this also entails is that Sunnis withhold their tongues regarding the companions. So when we do not curse the companions, this, some people understand, understand this to be that the Sunni Muslims believe that the companions Ali Muridwan are ma'asum, ma'asum meaning sinless, that they cannot commit sins. But in reality, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ordered in the hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ordered the future generations of restraining their tongues regarding the companions Ali Muridwan. It is one of the signs of the end of times that the later generation shall curse the earlier generation. These same companions that related the Quran to us, these same companions that related the Hadith to us, if we curse them because of whatever we perceive as being sins or those things which we perceive as being mistakes, then a person who does such an act has committed an enormity, meaning a major sin, by cursing the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But does this entail that the companions again were sinless? The answer is no. What the Sunni Muslim Islamic methodology is, that a person is impermitted to find faults in the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise a person who will do such a thing, can attempt to do such things with the Ahlul Bayt. There are people who go through the reports of the Ahlul Bayt and they will find faults with the Ahlul Bayt. They will go through uh, different narrations regarding Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, like an object to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. How will they object? They may object by saying, why did he stay away during the killing of Sayyiduna Uthman? Of course, Sunni scholarship is consistent because Sunni scholarship will say that he was not inactive 
Sayyiduna Ali radiyallahu an sent al-Imam al-Hassan wa al-Hussein radiyallahu anhuma to defend Sayyiduna Uthman. Sunni scholarship will always provide a response. But if there is a person with an agenda in order to insult the Ahlul Bayt, then such a person will look through the books of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the books of Hadith, compile so many different Hadith which they perceive as being false in the Ahlul Bayt. Like in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, there is a Hadith that Sayyiduna Abbas and Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhuma disputed in front of Sayyiduna Umar. In front of Sayyiduna Umar, they disputed. And the wording used in the hadith is that they insulted one another. This is used in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. So if a person from another sect approaches Sunni scholars and says, in your book Sahih al-Bukhari, there is such a narration which mentions such a line, the Sunni scholarship will say with regard to the Sahihain, that yes, Sunni scholarship does agree that Bukhari and Muslim are the most authentic hadith works. But does this entail that sometimes in the single reports, a narrator may not make a mistake in the wording? The answer is no. Sometimes a singular narrator can make a mistake, like the wording in one narration, Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. Surely my father and your father are in hellfire. This is found in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. Surely my father and your father are in hellfire. But we do not believe the father of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was a disbeliever. He was a believer. So what does Sunni scholarship say? They say that the narrator Hamad bin Salama, who is the student of Thabit al-Bunani, who is the student of Anas bin Malik, Hamad bin Salama made the mistake of adding the word inna abi. So does this mean the narration is weak? The answer is no, just that wording inna abi is weak. We accept the narration, but we reject the addition of Hamad bin Salama. This is in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. Likewise, the wording of a Zuhri, Ghadibat Fatima, that Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, became angry with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. This is the addition of whom? Of a Zuhri. And she did not talk to Abu Bakr Siddiq until she passed away radiallahu anha. This addition, this line is added by the narrator a Zuhri and is rejected by Sunni scholarship. Does this entail that Bukhari and Muslim are weak? The answer is no. The mistake of a singular narrator in a narration may be depending on a few words. And there are so many hadiths like this that are found in the books of hadith. So, when we discuss Adalatul Sahaba, it does not entail that the companions are sinless. But what Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah mean by this is that we restrain our tongues regarding them. We do not curse them. We do not insult them. If they accepted Islam in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his lifetime, in his company and they passed away in Islam, then this entails that they never lied regarding the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now Imam Ahmad bin Zaini Dahlan rahimahullah ta'ala al-Hassani who was the Mufti, the Jewish consult of Makkah al-Mukarrama in his time during the Ottoman period. He was from a Hassani lineage. He compiled a book in which he mentioned some of the verses of Al-Quran al Karim relating to the companions Ali Muridwan. If someone just recites Al-Quran al Karim in Surah Al-Tawbah and, Su- uh, and other verses in Surah Al-Hadid, they will find multiple verses which mentions the companions Ali Muridwan. One sample of this, or one uh, citation of this, is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hadid, uh, verse 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يستوي منكم لا يستوي means are not equal. لا يستوي منكم meaning from amongst you. Who is being addressed? The companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. من أنفق Those who spent أنفق is to spend in the way of Allah. من أنفق Whoever spent in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. من قبل الفتح Prior to al-fatih. Which al-fatih? 
Al-Fath is in reference to the conquering of Makkah al-Mukarramah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the companions, those companions who spent in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prior to the conquering of Makkah al-Mukarramah, they are not equal, meaning they are higher in status than whom? those who became Muslim after. وَقَاتَلَ And fought in the way of Allah. So, man anfaqa, whoever spent in the way of Allah, and whoever fought in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ulaika, those people. So those people prior to the conquering of Mecca, who spent in the way of Allah, and fought in the way of Allah, a'adhamu darajatan. They are greater in what? Status. A'adhamu darajatan. So, a, a common sense, was Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an were these people from amongst those who spent in the way of Allah and who fought in the way of Allah prior to the conquering of Makkah al mukarramah Answer is yes. How do we know this has reached us through mass transmission? Through mass transmission we know this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, min al darajatan min al Status from those min al anfaqu that spent in the way of Allah min ba'du after meaning after the conquering of Mecca those who became Muslims they still have a status but their status is not as high as those who spent prior to the conquering of Mecca al mukarramah wa qatalu and they fought in the way of Allah when Abu Sufyan we will cite Abu Sufyan as an example, why? Because Abu Sufyan is the father of whom? Muawiyah, radiallahu anhuma. Both of these, did they accept Islam after the conquering of Makkah al-Mukarramah? In fact, Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, accepted Islam prior, but announced his Islam after the conquering of Makkah. Nevertheless, when the battle of Hunayn occurred, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa took the army to Ta'if after the conquering of Makkah al-Mukarramah, the battle of Hunayn occurred, one of those people who was pulling the reins of the donkey of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was whom? Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan fought in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So he falls under this verse. Likewise Muawiyah. Radiallahu an. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Wa kullam wa'adallahu al husna. Kullan, all of them, all of these people, those who were Muslims prior to Al Fatih, the conquering of Makkah al Mukarramah, those who were Muslims after the conquering of Makkah al Mukarramah, who spent in the way of Allah and fought in the way of Allah, kullan, all of them, and this will note that the word comes nakira, meaning imperfect. This is inclusive of all of them. Kullan Allah. Allah promises them what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises them al-husna, goodness. What is this husna? We refer back to al-Quran al Karim again. Why we will not cite the Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih al-Imam Muslim or uh, Usul al-Kafi or Furu' al-Kafi? Why? Because many groups they will dispute the sourcing of those hadith but both groups or all sects in Islam will agree upon the Quran so our in, our deduction will be from uh, our induction will be from the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this is in surah al-anbiya watch how this verse explains this verse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَعَدَ اللَّهُ كُلَّمْ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى All of them Allah promised Al-Husna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ سَبَقَتْ لَهُمْ مِنَّ الْحُسْنَى إِنَّ الَّذِينَ شُولِي دَوْزْ سَبَقَتْ Preceded for them. لَهُمْ for them. مِنَّ الْحُسْنَى Preceded for them from us, meaning from Allah. Al-Husna, this Al-Husna, goodness. What shall happen to these people on the Day of Judgment? Because the context of the verse is regarding the Day of Judgment. Ula'ika, all those people, 
who, regarding whom Allah promised goodness. Anha mubadun, they will be removed far from hellfire. All of them will be removed far from what? Hellfire. This is just citation of one verse of Al Quran Al Karim. So this v- citation of the first verse, which was from Surah Al Hadid. Kullam wa'ad Allah al husna all of them Allah promised al husna And the verse of Surah Al-Anbiya explains that those who were promised al husna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said they will be mub'adun, removed from the hellfire. So if someone presents one hadith, one hadith, where people will come to the Hawd and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shall say, Ashabi, Ashabi, my companions, my companions. And the angels will say, you do not know what they did after you. And they will be dragged to the hellfire. The Sunni scholastic methodology will say this hadith must be interpreted. Why? It's a solitary report. Why should it be interpreted? Because the Quran tells us otherwise. Those who died in Islam, they will enter paradise. But someone may say, in this case, they will say, okay, in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa they were Muslim. But after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, they renegated from Islam. This is the next claim. In that case, if someone states regarding any companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa that he renegated from Islam, they must present proof which would impart certainty as opposed to doubt. If a companion like Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, they say regarding him, he, billah, he left the fold of Islam, in order to say such a thing, they would need to present certainty as opposed to doubt. But when we investigate all the reports, you will find, never mind the, 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 the claims regarding Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, you will find that the group of Muawiyah, the claims of disbelief regarding them are unfounded. A person cannot even establish disbelief regarding them. So, when certain claims are made regarding Sayyiduna Umar or claims like destroying the, the uh, damaging the door of uh, Sayyidah Fatima عنها, burning the house down, of course these are unfounded, unestablished claims. A person with any logic would think that if such an event had occurred, why would a Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha, after the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, approach Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an for fadak, a garden. If someone's house was burnt down, their child was martyred, which led to the passing away, according to their claims, which led to the passing away of a Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha. Why would a Sayyidah radiallahu anha approach Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an regarding a garden? What is a garden in comparison to the death of a child, to the burning of a house? So if such claims are made by any group that these events occurred, that the door of Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha was broken, the child was martyred, uh, the house was burnt down, these are major claims which a person must establish with solid proof as opposed to solitary reports or maybe unfounded reports even if the report is in Tariq Tabari with a chain of narration it is a solitary report and the report itself is weak so such a solitary report if such a major event had occurred this would not be one solitary report it would be narrated by so many people that today we would know the reality so this claim regarding a sahabatul kiram that there was a conspiracy against Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an is unfounded how does the claim make no sense? According to that claim, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, which we will cover in the questions that were sent to me, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, according to that claim, was dragged out of his house, beaten on the streets, and forced to give an oath of allegiance. Waliyadu billah. 
logically speaking, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was the man who had killed a warrior from every tribe of the Arabs. They say regarding him, his forearm was so strong that during the Khandaq battle, when Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an crossed the Khandaq in order to kill the disbeliever, he severed or cut, sliced the disbeliever in half, not only the disbeliever, his horse in half, until the strike, the blow was so powerful that the blade of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an struck the ground with strength and power. Such a warrior from the Arabs, such a warrior the Arabs had never seen. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an is not a man to be dragged on the streets. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an is not a man that whose house would be burnt down, his child martyred, and he would sit down. What proves this? When he was in a state to fight, was it at the time of the oath of allegiance to Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, or was it during the civil war? I would, say, I would say at the time of the oath of allegiance to Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. People deny this, but what proves this? In a Dara Qutni, this is from Sunni sources. Abu Sufyan said to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, when he heard that the oath of allegiance was given to Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, Abu Sufyan did not like this. Why? Because Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhuma were not from the strongest sub-tribe, sub-group of Quraysh. Sayyiduna Ali was from the most noble household of Quraysh. Abu Sufyan said, O oh Ali, I can fill this valley with horses and men in order to fight for you that we fight that the oath of allegiance be given to you. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an turned him away. Likewise, Bani Hashim was a stronger tribe than the other tribes. Banu Umayyah was not more powerful than the tribe of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. Yet when there was civil war and war ensued, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an fought in the battle of Jamal and fought in the battle of Sifin. For someone to say Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an fought in Sifin and Jamal and refused to fight when his own child was martyred, his house burnt down. And according to this claim, the oath of allegiance, the wasiyah, the wasiyah, the will of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa being forfeited. Because what this group claims, they say that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi before he passed away, he left a will for Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. That the leadership of the Muslims is or what they refer to as Al-Imama. This is for Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. And all the companions or majority of the companions refused to acknowledge this when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had passed away. So they say most this would entail leaving the religion because this concept of Al-Imama which is the leadership of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an is a tenet of faith according to that group. They believe anyone who uh, believes in Al-Imamah is a believer and anyone who denies Al-Imamah is a disbeliever. He becomes a disbeliever. So, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas The Quran states, you were the best of nation that has been extracted for humanity. Who was this in reference to? Was the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to this conspiracy theory this would entail that all of them renegade majority of them renegated from the religion and the the wasiya the will of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was abandoned sayyiduna ali radiyallahu an according to our sunni belief is, is such an individual that would never have performed taqiyya what is taqiyya covering of truth when a person fears for his life why? Because Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was the strongest warrior the Arabs had seen. Secondly, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an had so much support that even his son, Sayyiduna Ali Imam al Hassan, when he went and according to the, the book, Rijalu Kashi, 
which is a book of Asma Rijal of, of that group. In that book, it mentions that Sayyiduna Al Imam Al Hassan and Sayyiduna Al Imam Al Hussein radiallahu anhuma gave bay'a oath of allegiance to Muawiyah radiallahu an. But when Sayyiduna Al Imam Al Hassan came, they say regarding Sayyiduna Al Imam Al Hassan that he, he had over 40,000 warriors just at that time. <laughs> Each warrior had sons who were ready to fight also. And this is just from the people of Kufa. They said to him, You have warriors from Al-Basra. You have the warriors of Al-Hijaz. You have the warriors of Yemen. Why do you forfeit the Caliphate and give the oath of allegiance to Muawiyah radiallahu an? This shows the level of support that Sayyiduna Al-Imam Al-Hassan radiallahu an had. This level of support Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an also had. And Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an never fought against Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an. Instead, he was one of those who Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an consulted. Now we move on to <coughs> some of the questions which were sent to me. Some of these questions were written out last year. So I was unable to answer some of them. But inshallah, Allah willing, today we will go through uh, most of them. <coughs> One of the questions is if Sayyiduna Ali, so the, the person has written, if Hazrat Ali had no issues with Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an, Uthman, then why did he not take part in any battles during their time? If it wasn't necessary at the time, why did he unsheathe his sword when he was uh, so in battle of uh, Jamal, Sifin and Nahrawan? This is the question the person has asked. The response to this question is very simple. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was asked why in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq and Sayyiduna Umar and Sayyiduna Uthman, the majority of these caliphate, the majority of the caliphate of Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu anhum, why did we have prosperity and peace for the most part? Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an said that those three had people like me to consult. And I have people like you to consult. During that time, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an did not take part in those battles. Very true. But did Sayyiduna Uthman take part in battles under Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq? The answer is no. Did Sayyiduna Uthman fought, fight battles under Sayyiduna Umar? The answer is no. So this rule does not only apply on Sayyiduna Ali, the question can be asked regarding Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu anhuma. Likewise, did Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an fight any battles under Sayyiduna Abu, under the order of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq? The answer is no. These people were a part of the body of consultation Ashura and they were kept close to the Khalifa in order to advise him. This can be found in so many narrations that the main advisor for Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an was whom? Was Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. In Sunni sources, this is very clear. If you read through Sunni works of hadith, the main advisor for Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an was Sayyiduna Ali. Someone needs to ask those people a question also. When Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an placed someone to undertake to uh, undertake the guardianship of Alf, of the garden of fadak who was the individual who was given the charge of fadak the response is sayyiduna ali radiyallahu an so sayyiduna ali asadullah radiyallahu an was the one who was the guardian of fadak under Sayyidu, in, in the khilafah of sayyiduna umar radiyallahu an one fifth of the produce that was made from the garden would be given to the family of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, and four fifths of the produce was distributed amongst the poor. Someone may say, then, why did Umar bin Abdul Aziz change 
This, the answer is Umar bin Abdul Aziz radiallahu anh, did not change this. After the caliphate of Muawiyah, when the leadership of other Bani Umayyah kings started, some of those Bani Umayyah stopped giving one-fifth of the produce to the Ahlul Bayt. So under the leadership of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar al Farooq, Uthman al Ghani, Ali al Murtada, Al Imam al Hassan, five people, and Muawiyah radiallahu anhum, these six companions, under their leadership, one fifth of the produce of the garden of Fadak was given to the Ahlul Bayt. Later on, some of the Banu Umayyah changed this, then Umar bin Abdul Aziz restored it back to what it was. Now, the other group, they change this and distort this in order to make it seem that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was the one to do this. But if you are citing Sunni sources, then cite them correctly. Because in the Sunni sources, it mentions that the one who was given guardianship of the garden of Fadak was Sayyiduna Ali, alongside with Sayyiduna Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Alongside with Sayyiduna Abbas, later on Sayyiduna Abbas was removed and the total guardianship was given to Sayyiduna Ali. Karamallahu wa jahul kareem. Someone, the questioner says, if that particular group were responsible for the killing of Imam Hussein, radiallahu an, why didn't Ahl Sunnah rescue him? No one is saying any particular group martyred Sayyiduna Ali Imam Al Hussein except the army of whom? Except the army of Yazid. Meaning, the assailants who martyred Sayyiduna Ali Imam Al Hussein radiallahu an were the assailants from the army of Yazid. As for Ahl Sunnah, Al Imam Al Hussein radiallahu an was the leader of Ahl Sunnah in his time. Meaning, the majority of the Muslims, what we call Al Kafratul Kafira, the vast majority of Muslims that were around in that time, Sayyiduna Ali Imam Hussein radiallahu an was their leader. No one had known at that time that when Sayyiduna Ali Imam Hussein radiallahu an was marching with his family across the desert to Al Kufa, that he would be intercepted by an army. If the people of Al Madinah Al Munawwara had known this, and the people of Makkah Al Mukarramah had known this, then the people of Makkah and the people of Al Madinah would have defended Al Imam Al Hussein. How can such a person think that the people of Makkah Al Mukarramah and Al Madinah Al Munawwara, the two places of Islam, the two places where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam nurtured a group, a generation of people, those two pe- groups of people would uh, trait Al Imam Al Hussein radiallahu an or abandon Al Imam Al Hussein radiallahu an. <coughs> Another question here. The questioner asks, Muawiyah spent his days cursing and swearing at Hazrat Ali radiallahu an. Why is he still held in high regard by Ahl Sunnah? If there is ikhtilaf on this issue, should one remain silent or be against Muawiyah radiallahu anhu majma'i? This is a very famous a uh, quote mentioned by these people that Muawiyah radiallahu an cursed Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an from the pulpits for many years. In fact, for f- over 14 years now, I have been asking the Shia to show a narration which mentions Muawiyah radiallahu an cursing Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an or ordering another person to curse. What tends to be cited is a narration that a person comes into the court of Muawiyah an, and Amir Muawiyah an asks them, why do you not curse Ali? And then that companion will cite the virtues of Sayyiduna Ali an. This happened with Abdullah bin Abbas anhuma. He came into the presence of Muawiyah an. Muawiyah radiallahu an asked him, why do you not curse Ali? And Ibn Abbas 
started to cite the different virtues of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. So rather than cursing Sayyiduna Ali, Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an was encouraging people to recite the virtues of Sayyiduna Ali. Why was he doing this? He was doing this because there were people present who thought that Sayyiduna Ali had no virtue. So when the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa would enter, he would make them recite the different virtues of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an. If he was a tyrant, as those people would want us to believe, a tyrant like Fir'aun or tyrant like other people, he would have martyred that very companion for even reciting any virtue of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, which he did not do. Someone may say then, why did Umar bin Abdul Aziz stop the cursing of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an? The answer, remember, Umar bin Abdul Aziz became Khalifa in the year 99 and passed away in the year 101. The cursing of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, the inception of that was not done by Amir Muawiyah. Someone may say, but Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an stipulated that the cursing should not be done. I said such reports are not authentic. Why? Because Sayyiduna Ali, Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an would not have given oath of allegiance to a man who cursed Sayyiduna Ali. This is an insult. This in fact is an insult to Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an. To say that Sayyiduna Ali Imam, okay, the person may say he didn't give bay'ah, but according to Rijal Kashi and other sources, he, Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an gave oath of allegiance. If he did not give oath of allegiance, he had enough strength and power in order to defeat this person. Yet Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an did not defeat him, he made peace with him. If they held Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan in a high esteem, like they do regarding Sayyiduna Ali Imam al hussein they would hold gatherings in, in commemoration or anniversary for Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan radiallahu an. But never have I heard regarding Matam mourning being done for Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan. Never do you hear of anyone beating their chest for Sayyiduna Ali Imam al-Hassan. Why the skip from Al Imam al Hassan to Sayyiduna Al Imam al Hussein? If Sayyiduna Al Imam al Hassan, according to them, was martyred by Amir Muawiyah, the father of Yazid, if Sayyiduna Amir Muawiyah martyred Sayyiduna Al Imam al Hassan, radiallahu anhuma, then why not hold 40 days of mourning after the martyrdom date? This is not done. Why the specification for the day of Karbala only? So, for this person to claim that the cursing was done by Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an, the answer is no such report has ever been authenticated. And neither has this practice ever been proven from Amir Muawiyah. The person asks, Shia believes are that Umar radiallahu an was behind the death of Sayyida Fatima radiallahu an. So what is the Sunni uh, view? Now, this sums up the entire argument. This question sums up the entire argument. The fallacious claim that Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an martyred Sayyidatuna Fatima radiallahu anha and Sayyiduna Imam Ali radiallahu an prayed prayers behind him. Sayyiduna Imam Ali radiallahu an who fought in Sifin and fought in Jamal, fought his enemies. This warrior of the Arabs did not take revenge for Sayyidatun Nisa. Does this make any common sense? Does it make any sense for us to believe that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was, was dragged on the streets and was disgraced and his wife was killed according to this questioner and according to that group? And yet Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an stayed silent and subdued. Wal-iyadu billah. This in fact sums up the very, the very conspiracy theory which starts from the caliphate of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq. The question is, in the caliphate of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leave a wasiyah, a will, that after me Ali radiallahu an shall be, shall be imam? This is the start of the conspiracy theory. Then the conspiracy theory goes on to say, 
that over 100,000 companions agreed upon Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq. Over 100,000 people were involved in this conspiracy. Then this conspiracy goes on to say that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was subdued to such an extent that his wife is killed, his child is killed, his house is burnt down to the ground, and Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an does not take, ask for justice. Likewise, Sayyiduna Ali Imam al Hassan does not take justice. Likewise, Sayyiduna Ali Imam al Hussein radiallahu an does not take justice. This is the starting point of the entire conspiracy. This then moves on to other historical events that occurred in Muslim history. From those historical events, this moves on to disputes regarding other branches of Iman. And other branches like, uh, for instance, is it an obligation upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appoint an Imam according to 12 theology? It would be an obligation upon Allah. According to Sunni theology, the answer would be no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not obliged. Likewise, other disputes regarding muta'a, temporary marriage, likewise uh, the, the fiqh, the jurisprudence. But the start of this very dispute starts from this conspiracy theory. How can an individual believe? That Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an killed Sayyidatuna Fatima radiallahu anha. This is absurd. And then Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an married the daughter of Sayyiduna Ali. Now some of them reject that historical fact. But they would have to reject the historical fact. Why? Because then that would mean the very murderer marries the daughter of the woman he murdered. Waliyadu billah. This sums up the entire conspiracy theory. Based on this foundation then the person peruses through different Sunni books and tries to find and takes things out of context. One example of a decontextualized quote is then one of them says that Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an placed his hand into the backside of a camel and they quote this when in reality if you check the report the camels of the sadaqat, the charity were brought and some of them were injured the wording of the hadith is that Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an placed his arm into the wound and he said if these camels are not treated right then Umar is responsible but what is their public told that he placed the hand into the backside they mistranslate the Arabic and they spread this on social media on on internet sites this is examples of the stupidity so this entire conspiracy theory starts from this inshallah we will stop here and uh, we will be supplicating for Sayyiduna Ali Imam Al Hussein radiallahu an. After Isha prayer, I will be here and stay here for questions and answers, insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam amahu ahluh. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam amahu ahluh. Jazallahu anna Sayyidina Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam amahu ahluh. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين